Alrighty, thank you very much for coming everybody. We're here today to talk about uh, preparing for further education for people with disability in Australia. I wanted to start off with an acknowledgement of country. And I acknowledge that I'm hosting this meeting from the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nations. I acknowledge the traditional custodians, custodians of the various lands on which you participate today and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this meeting. Pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples, their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of Australia. Today we're going to have a chat about, um, well first we're going to do some introductions, then we'll have a chat about the definition of disability within Australia, uh, how disability uh, works in relation to education in Australia, uh, disclosure or talking about your disability to education providers. Then we have Meg who's going to talk about how the NDIS can support tertiary education goals and then we'll have a question time at the end. Before we get started I'd really love to just get a feeling in the room of how people are feeling about transitioning to education, uh, higher education or supporting people that are transitioning to higher education. So I'm going to launch a poll, which will pop on, up on your screen. The responses will be confid confidential and it would be fantastic if you could pop in a response to how you're feeling about the subject at the moment. Alrighty, give another 10 seconds. Beautiful, thank you very much. I'm going to move that now and move on. So, introductions for today. My name's Amy. I am a National Disability Coordination Officer and I'm employed by the Inner Melbourne VET Cluster. My role is funded by the Federal Department for Education, Skills and Employment and our goal is to remove gaps and barriers so that people with disability can reach their goals in tertiary education and, for, and subsequent employment. With us today we also have Meg Orman, she's a Senior Community Engagement Officer and she works for the National Disability Insurance Agency. With Meg today, we have two interpreters. Their names are Therese and Dave. So if you're in need of their sign language interpreting, you can pin their video by clicking on the three buttons in the corner of their little screen and pushing the pin button. We also have with us today, Stephanie Hansen. She works at the Skills and Job Centre at Swinburne University in Technology. And you'll hear a bit more from her next week, more so than today. So what is disability? In Australia, over 4 million people have a disability. That's about one in five people. Disability can be visible or non-visible, which is really important to understand because there's a lot of stigma around the idea that disability is those things that we expect and that we see. Things like um, somebody needing a wheelchair or a guide dog to be able to move around. But disability is so much more than that and covers things like mental health concerns, uh, chronic illnesses and behavioural issues and mental health as well. Disability can be temporary, permanent or intermittent. Really important to understand that well, temporary, well, that's something that um, might heal. For example, somebody might have a car accident and need to relearn how to walk. So they'll have a disability for six months or 12 months, but then they'll learn to walk again and won't have a disability after that. Other disabilities are permanent or intermittent, which is an interesting one in the study and workspace because that's the idea that on one day, somebody might be experiencing um, a lot of issues that, that come out of their disability and on other days they won't. And that can be a bit difficult for teachers and employers to get their heads around sometimes. 
Other really important thing to understand is that no two people with the same disability experience their disability in the same way. So just because my friend with autism might need to try on five or six pairs of socks before he can find one that's comfortable for the day, doesn't mean that every person with autism in Australia needs to do that. So that comes up a little bit later when we're talking about disclosure because it's really important to understand how your disability can impact your studies. If we're going to look for a legal definition of disability in Australia, we look to the Disability Discrimination Act. Now, our definition is based on a medical model, which means that it outlines the different types of um, ways that you can be, you can have a disability. Things like total or partial loss of a, of a person's body or mental functions, the presence of organisms that cause an illness or disease or a disorder or illness that affects a person's thought processes, perception of reality, emotions or judgment, or that results in disturbed behaviour. So this legal definition is generally what you would need to apply to if you were hoping to receive support services uh, in education uh, or, or a plan within the NDIS. Um, and it's very much based on what your doctor says about your disability. Now, the world is progressing a little bit from that. Um, and the United Nations UNH, Human Rights Commission, I always get mixed up with the UNHCR, uh, they base their definition of disability on what is called the social model. And this is the idea that people with impairments are disabled by the barriers in society. The impairment being the medical condition that leads to the disability and the barriers that can be placed in front of a person with an impairment are things like a physical barrier, such as steps, attitudes, the ways that we communicate or the ways that we behave socially. The social model of disability says that it's not that a person isn't able to walk that is the disability. The disability is actually the stairs that keep a wheelchair user from entering the building. The social model seeks to change society because that people with disability have a right to fully participate. Now, if we look at disability in education, students with disability have the right to take part in education on the same base as their peers without disability. These rights are protected by the Disability Standards for Education, and you can find them enacted in law under the Disability Discrimination Act. The standards say that education providers, so that's your TAFE, universities, RTOs, wherever you're getting your education from, those providers must consult with students about what their needs are, provide reasonable adjustments, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute, and prevent harassment and victimization. To access these rights though, you'll probably need to speak to your provider about your disability and how it affects your ability to study. So we mentioned reasonable adjustment, adjustments. The, these rights are protected under the standards. A reasonable adjust, adjustment is an action that is taken to assist a student with disability to participate in education and training on the same basis as other students. The goal then is to place the student in a more, at a more equal footing, but not to give any kind of advantage. So there can sometimes be a bit of stigma around adjustments being an unfair head start, but that's not how they are arranged. It is about taking away those barriers that we talked about so that a person is able to complete their studies in the, at the same basis as any other student. Adjustments are developed in consultation or by talking with your education provider and often through in the sector what we call a disability practitioner. Now to access a disability practitioner at the institution that you choose to go to, they're not always going to have the same name or be in the same place. So you might have to do a little bit of research and that can generally happen on the web page for that institution in their search if you just pop in disability, often the contacts will come up. Some examples of reasonable adjustments, and I've just popped a few here because next week, Sophie from Swinburne Accessibility is going to come and have a much more in-depth chat with us about this. But just to we, so that we can get our heads around it, some examples might be things like classes being held in an accessible room, uh, the provision of note takers, readers or writers, some assistive technology, 
to help somebody. It could be a, a voice to text type situation. It can also be extra times and rests in exams or course materials being provided in an alternative format. For example, uh, if somebody was blind, we might provide it uh, written materials in Braille. Uh, and there can also be simple things like somebody with ADHD who has poor executive functioning might need to touch base with a coach every week or two to talk about how they can organise their studies. There's lots of different reasonable adjustments that can be made. Now, the second right that was protected under this, uh, the standards for education was about consultation. The, unit, the, pro, the further education provider has an obligation to consult with you about making reasonable adjustments. They'll need to talk to you about whether the adjustment that you're seeking is reasonable. And their one way of not doing it is if they have unjustifiable hardship in providing that adjustment. And if that was to happen, they would need to talk to you about an adjustment that could be less disruptive, but still beneficial to you. And they'll also need to talk with you about how any adjustment would be able to support your needs. But in able to be able to get these rights, students also have responsibilities. The first really important one is to investigate what's called the inherent requirements of the course you hope to take. This means that there are certain skills and abilities and knowledge that you need to be able to present or show or do by the time that you finish the course to show that you're prepared and able to complete the kind of jobs that you'll be qualified for. So you'll need to have a look through all of the information that you receive about the course and make sure, make an honest assessment of yourself and whether you think given adjustments, you would be able to complete those tasks and be able to perform that job. There is no um, rule that says you must disclose a disability unless your disability presents a risk to yourself or others. So for example, some behavioral disabilities um, can result in some violent behavior. If that was the, your case, then you would, by law, need to disclose your disability to the institution so that they can help you and the people around you to create a strategy about how we can make sure that other people aren't at risk. And as we mentioned before, if you want to access support or adjustments, you need to be prepared to tell certain people about your dis disability and discuss your support needs. So telling your education provider about your disability is called disclosure. Uh, it means sharing information about your disability, but it's your personal choice, like we mentioned before, unless other people are at risk, you don't have to tell anybody. And who you tell, how much you tell, and when you tell is up to you. Um, many students choose to disclose because you need to do this to be able to access reasonable adjustments. Other people choose not to disclose because they don't want to have their disability um, overrule their identity and who they are or because they fear facing stigma. Disclosing disability doesn't mean that you have to tell everything about your disability. You probably will be asked to give some written information from your doctor, which is going to name your disability, but you don't have to give the everyday ins and outs. What you, do, what you will need to give is how the, your disability impacts your study and what supports might be needed. Now, coming out of secondary school, sometimes we haven't really had a lot of time or opportunity to have a think about what this is because our parents and our support staff and our teachers um, put these sorts of things in around us. So to prepare for that meeting where you choose to talk about your disability with the, the professionals, then you'll need to have a think about what supports have you been given before? How does your disability not, not impact your life, but your study? And what sort of things do you think will help you moving forward? It's really important to understand that your disclosure information is protected by privacy law and can't be shared without your permission. Uh, and when it is shared, 
then it, the information that shares has to be very relevant to the relationship that you have with that person. It doesn't have to be everything. So for example, your lecturer or teaching staff don't need to even know the name of your disability or any of the ins and outs of your life. They might just need to know that you need your information shared in a, your course materials are shared in an alternative format. So you have a lot of control over where your information goes and who has it. And actually at the stage of life that you're at at the moment, it's also important to think about your, the fact that you're turning 18, which means that your parents or caregivers no longer have the right to your, to your information without your permission. Now I say that very carefully because I'm very aware that parents and carers actually are fantastic supports for students and we need them in our lives. But sometimes they can get in the way and sometimes you would prefer them not to be communicating with your education providers and that's actually your right. I've got a little video I'd like to share about disclosure here for you now. So from starting Oxford, I was really close. I didn't like talking about my disability at all. Um, and now I'm coming forward to even be in a, a video. So this is my uh, coming out video for uh, friends that don't know. I can understand that it, it's not always easy to kind of talk about the things that you, you have difficulty with. But my advice would be overwhelmingly to kind of be honest and say, actually, this is this is what it is. This is how my disability affects me. And then that will help the disability service to help you. I would definitely say if you're not sure about disclosing a disability, just do it because there's no stigma, there's no judgment, there's just loads of support waiting for you and the university are really keen to give it, so don't worry. We wouldn't disclose that information unless the student had actually provided consent and when they have provided consent, we would liaise with a disability contact at the college and a disability contact at the department to ensure that those reasonable adjustments have been put in place for the student. It's really important to draw attention to, to things that you find difficult and things that not just for you personally, but that probably will help other people as well. And I think if you draw attention to these things, then there's every chance that, that they can get sorted. So while that video was from Oxford University in England, um, I thought it was still really interesting to hear the, the students' perspectives. Obviously, some of the information that the disability practitioner shared about who they would share information with would be different in Australia because well, we don't call it a college and we don't share your information with the department. But other than that, I thought it was a really useful video to watch. So from so what do you do if you feel like your rights aren't being met? If you're unhappy with the decisions made about your support or you feel that you've been harassed and victimised and your learning provider isn't supporting you in that, you have the right to make a complaint. The first step in this process is really to have a chat with your disability practitioner at your education provider. Sometimes there can be some confusion between the, your teaching staff and some misunderstanding about what supports you need. And sometimes just a really simple conversation can be the easiest way to clear it up. But if that hasn't worked and you're still unhappy, your next step is to follow your education provider's procedures for making complaints. It's gonna be called something different at each institution, but again, you can use that search bar on the website. If you put in the word complaints, you'll find how your university or TAFE expects you to make complaints. Um, my top piece of advice in this area is to make sure that you're keeping records of everything that you give, everything that each step that you've made, particularly when you're making complaints, uh, every email you send. Once again, we talked about how you're at that stage of your life now where you're turning 18 and you're becoming responsible for yourself. And in the past, it's possibly your teachers or your parents or carers who have kept your records. But one of the really important things that you can do to make your life easier later on now is to set yourself up a folder in the cloud somewhere and a folder in your inbox, in your email, and save every little piece of documentation you come across because it will make your life easier later on when you've got to prove your disability or when you've got to chat about what supports you've used in the past. 
So if you've gotten through the procedure for making complaints at your institution, the next step is to have a chat with the Australian Human Rights Commission. Because the standards are enacted in law under the Disability Discrimination Act, it means that the Human Rights Commission is able to advocate on your behalf and help you sort out your complaint. So that was all that we had planned to talk about. There'll be an opportunity to ask some questions in a second. Uh, as many of you will know, we have another session planned for next week. At that session, we're going to talk about planning ahead, what you can do now to start getting ready for your first day. Uh, Stephanie's going to talk to us about the different career pathways. Career pathways is a bit of a jargon talk that we use in the sector, but basically it means the different ways that you can get to your end goal. Sometimes it might start with quite a small course so that you can get a taster for something. It doesn't necessarily mean going straight to university from school. Uh, then we're going to have Sophie come in from the accessibility team at Swinburne University. She's going to talk to us some more about those reasonable adjustments and the different types of support that you can receive from your education institution. We are also hoping to have some students with disability that are studying at the moment come and have a chat to you about their experiences. And then we'll have a bit of a question time um, the students have agreed to sit on a panel and hear your questions. 